Hello and welcome to episode 88 of the Synergen Leadership Podcast. For those of you listening for the first time, my name is Julian Carl and I'm the CEO and the co-founder of Synergen Group. Passionate about all things leadership and management, so passionate in fact that I decided to start a podcast about it. And here we are in season two and my purpose for the podcast continues to be the same, to raise the standard of leadership. In today's show, I speak with Shane Hatton, who is the author of Lead the Room, Communicate a Message that Counts in Moments that Matter. Shane has spent more than a decade of his career consulting and working in in in-house marketing and communications, gaining a deep appreciation of effective messaging that enables you to not only be heard, but remembered. He spent seven years leading, speaking, coaching, and mobilizing volunteers in the not-for-profit sector, where he was responsible for building and nurturing the health, growth, and culture of a rapidly expanding membership. It's this experience at the intersection of people, communication, and leadership, along with his studies in business and psychology, that formed the foundation for his work today as a trainer, author, and speaker to leaders and teams. Shane knows the deep satisfaction of standing in front of a team of people, watching the lights go on, knowing they are with you at the same time, understanding the sense of panic that can take hold when all eyes are on you in the crucial moments. He is a self-described charismatic introvert, so is needed to learn how to face the fear of public speaking by embracing the potential of platform leadership. He's always believed that great communication is much bigger than speaking, that it must be viewed through the lens of leadership, and it's through this lens that he approaches his work. We don't need better speakers, he believes. We need great leaders. So during the course of the conversation, we explore his book in great detail. I start off by asking Shane, why did he decide to write this book? We speak about what kind of leader people want to be and how they can develop their character. We discuss the five levels of leadership credibility and how to manage reputation. And I finish the interview by asking Shane about the three ways to challenge dysfunctional thinking. So keep listening and as always, really like to hear your thoughts about the interview with Shane Hatton, author of Lead the Room, Communicate a Message that Counts in Moments that Matter. Happy listening. Welcome to the Synergen Leadership Podcast with Julian Carl. Julian returns in 2019 with weekly conversations with leaders and authors from Australia and around the world, giving you the opportunity to share in their journey and learn from their expertise and knowledge. Julian also shares some of the tools and techniques he uses as a leader, mentor and facilitator, helping you to build your leadership capability and improve your confidence as a leader. Welcome, Shane, to the Synergen Leadership Podcast. Really appreciate uh, you taking the time to come out to HQ and hang out with me so that the listeners have a bit of an idea about who you are. Who is Shane Hatton? I think I wake up every day and look in the mirror and ask myself the same question. It's a process that's evolving and growing, but put simply, I am a speaker, author, and trainer. And I help leaders to essentially build and leverage their platform, their leadership platform to help lead and inspire and mobilize their people. So we're here to talk about your book, Lead the Room, Communicate a Message that Counts in Moments of Matter. And I'm always excited to interview another major street publisher. So shout out to, to, to Leslie. Why did you decide to write the book? One of the first questions I always ask people when they're considering whether or not they should say something As I say, there's a big difference between saying something and having something valuable to say and consider whether you have something valuable to say before you say something. So I've been training in a lot of the content of the book for the last couple of years and I think it reached a point where I I realized I had something valuable to share and so I sat down, I wrote the book really with the intention of helping people become more effective leaders. Okay. So I want to start off with a a bit of an excerpt that uh, resonated with me. You don't need another book on presentation skills, I get that, and that's not really what I'm here for. My goal in writing this book isn't to help you become a better speaker, I want to help you become a more effective leader. I'm happy if this book helps you nail your next presentation, but I'd much rather equip you to leverage your platform to lead and mobilise your team. In the process of helping you do that, I hope you'll become better at public speaking too. So why is public speaking such a crucial part of leadership? Well, I use the word platform leadership and it's a bit of an unknown term and people think about, okay, well, what's your platform? And really every leader has a platform. It could be eight people that you have a weekly stand-up meeting with. It could be a thousand employees that you got across your organization. Uh, It could be uh, just a circle of influence. Everyone has a platform where they have the opportunity to communicate to those people uh, frequently. 
and really for for leaders to help build and leverage that platform, they've got to see it as an opportunity, not just to become a great speaker. The world has plenty of great keynote speakers and plenty of opportunities to develop your presentation skills. For me, it was all about how do we leverage those crucial moments where you've got a platform to say something that really counts and say something that really matters and to help mobilize people and, and inspire people and help people take action. So you write in this book, uh, one of the first questions you ask people is, what kind of leader do you want to be? Why is that such an important question that people should be asking themselves? Yeah, one of my first jobs was working for a university and we were going through the process of rebranding, changing the name, uh, changing a lot of our marketing collateral. And we, we moved to this expression, this phrase, be what you want to be. And the whole campaign was centered around deciding, well, who do I want to be? And then what do I need to be able to to do to get to where I want to be? I think it's an important question for any leader to ask is, well, what kind of leader do you want to be? How do you want to be known as a leader? What would, what do you want to come to people's mind when they think about you uh, as a leader? And often one of the biggest challenges when it comes to, to leveraging a platform is that I think we all want to be the respected leader. And we want to be a leader that influences and inspires change, but maybe something gets in the way of that. And sometimes it's, it could be that resistance to speaking. We don't want to do any kind of public speaking. And so we end up being the invisible leader. And it's really hard to have influence as an invisible leader. And I often say you can't follow an invisible leader. And you talk about the three big obsessions. What are, what are these three big obsessions that you're talking about? Yeah, well, one of the first questions people often ask me when it, they find out that I help leaders become more effective communicators, especially around public speaking, is they always want to know, well, how do I project my voice? How do I make sure that I, I have this commanding authority or this presence on stage? They, uh, they want to know all the tips and the techniques and the tools to become a more confident communicator. And I often find that's a really narrow approach to a much bigger uh, opportunity. And when we focus on the how, we often are just focused on the techniques and the tools. And I think there's a much bigger picture that we can look at. The first question I ask is, well, who are you as a leader? Because often who you are is underpinning what you say and how you say it. And the second question is, well, what do you have to say that's actually valuable to the people that you're communicating with? And so it's not just how you deliver it. It's also who and, and what you have to say as well. So I, I tend to zoom out on that picture and go, well, how do, we, how do we look at this more holistically rather than just focusing on the tools and the techniques? And I want to start exploring uh, some of some of the key points that came out for me, and one of them was this idea of developing your character, and you, and you speak about this in, in Chapter 1. So I'm curious, how do leaders go about doing that? Yeah, talking again, coming back to the idea of those three obsessions, I often say the obsessions sit at the intersection of who you are, what you have to say, and how you say it. The first obsession is really around, well, who are you and what do you have to say? And I call that obsession the obsession around positioning. Um, positioning is uh, really comes from this Latin origin of punia, which essentially means to place something. And so I talk about positioning is how do people place you in their mind? So when your name comes up at a barbecue, when your name comes up around the office, how do the people place you in their mind? Because how people place you in their mind has a big impact on how they perceive you and how they listen to you and whether or not they actually listen to what you have to say. So when I talk about positioning, a big piece that sits in positioning is this idea of how to develop your character. Because everything that happens on stage gets underpinned by what happens essentially backstage. And so the character piece is all around behind the curtain, what's going on there. You know, we, we look in the news regularly and we see stories of leaders, high profile leaders uh, who potentially didn't know they were being recorded or didn't know something was happening. <laughs> yeah. And all of a sudden their character comes out into the spotlight and it under undermines everything that they've been saying and everything that they've been doing. And so our character is so crucial because really I often say a spotlight doesn't make a leader, it reveals them. And so when you get in the spotlight, your strengths get highlighted, but also your flaws get revealed. And so characters, everything that's going on behind the curtain, that is essentially going to set you up for everything that happens on the stage. Yeah. And you're encouraging people to look at the, the habits that they have. Mm. Uh, how do they go about building better habits? James Clear has a phenomenal book on habits called Atomic Habits, and he often talks about the small 1% things that we do that help us become more of the person that we want to be. Um, we often look at habits through the lens of, all oh, this is what I need to do more of. He really reframes that through the lens of, what's the kind of person that I want to become, and looks at building really um, 
strong habits in the small details of our life to help set us up for what we need to do. Leadership's a big responsibility. I think you know that much as, as, as I do and everyone who's listening understands that. And so if the foundations aren't there and if the habits that you've got built in behind the scenes aren't setting you up for leadership, leadership's heavy. It's a big responsibility. And so your habits are underpinning everything that you're doing to sustain you for the long-term journey of leadership. So talk to me about this idea of leading your narrative because uh, I'm particularly curious around this because I do think that uh, leaders in general need to be better at, at telling a narrative. Mm-hmm. So how do you suggest they uh, they look at it, go about it, start it? Yeah. If you would describe reputation as what pe- other people are saying about you on, on, on when you're on stage, think about reputation or, or narrative as what's happening backstage of reputation. Who you decide that you want to be is eventually going to be how people talk about you and how people know you. I think one of the biggest challenges is that we haven't decided who do I want to be first. And because we haven't decided who we want to be, we struggle to build a strong reputation around that So because we haven't decided our narrative. And one of the biggest pushbacks I often get from people around that is that they go, oh, well, you're just projecting somebody that you're not. You're trying to put someone out there that you're not. And I say, actually, it's not about projecting somebody that you're not. It's about deciding who you want to be and then amplifying that to the rest of the world. I think there's a great quote by Dolly Parton. um, And she said, decide who you want to be and then be that on purpose. And I think leading your narrative is all about making that decision. This is how I'd love to be known. And then then ultimately working out how can I be that more purposefully. Why do you think people sometimes have that response? Because I've come across that as well. Oh, you know, you're just projecting that you're someone that you're not really. Yeah. Do you think that's... There's any element of the whole tall poppy in that? Or? There's, there's probably elements of tall poppy, but probably beneath the surface, there's that imposter syndrome. And people are feeling like, well, I couldn't possibly project that um, and be that or do that. And really, it's it's the front stage fear of, okay, if I tell people I'm that, people might criticize me or they might say that I'm not that. But really, what we're trying to do is not, again, try not trying to project somebody we're not. We're making that decision. If this is who I want to be, and I decide on that, then what are the actions that would follow that help me to be more of that person? Um, and who would become, who can we ultimately become? Yeah. yeah so I'm always uh, curious about people's motivations when they, when they push back. Yeah. On, and the motivations come back to the character as yeah. well, because the character has to feed into your narrative and your narrative ultimately becomes your, your reputation. Yeah. So it very much ties all together. It all ties together and part of your positioning as a leader. Yeah. Do you think a lot of leaders don't actually take the time to, reflect on this like they're so caught up doing what they need to do that they don't actually take that time yeah we because we're most of the time in leadership we're front stage or we're on stage and so most of the time we're in front of people or we're having to respond to situations or we're face to face with people and most of our time is often spent down you know in the ditches doing the work and so we often don't take the time to step back and look at what's going on behind the curtain and because we don't deal with issues of character they eventually get revealed um, in a public forum and we haven't dealt with it or we often hear about a reputation um, and it's because we've never been intentional behind the scenes of how we, we want our narrative to be led and so everything that's going on behind the scenes is just as important as everything that's happening uh, out in the public. So you write about uh, the importance of credibility and you suggest that credibility speaks louder than capability. (laughs) (laughs) Talk to me about that. Yeah, I often say to people, your position might uh, give you a platform or an opportunity, but really credibility is what gives you a voice. Um, Credibility is almost like attaching some lead weights to your words. And you notice a big difference when a person stands up to speak that has been given the opportunity because of their role or their position or maybe just because they're really good at what they do versus a person who's done the long journey of building credibility over time. I mean, I've been to conferences um, where there are really excellent communicators, really great speakers, and people are engaged. They listen to what they have to say. And then there's a person who maybe isn't a great speaker, but they've got this incredible credibility behind them. And everyone just, they lean in in this new way. They engage, they take notes, they listen, they take it on board. And I would say that's the the weight of credibility that gets added to your words that's built over a long process of time. Yeah, I think uh, Edward de Bono, uh, fits that have you ever seen him speak when he uh i remember i saw him in an event and he literally sat down he had an old school um transparency projector and was writing on the transparency projector and talking not even looking at the audience 
or anything, but I could see the whole audience was hanging off yeah. every word. And you see that with great with great um, leaders. It's it's not that they're necessarily great keynote speakers. They've just got a weight of credibility, and you you don't build credibility overnight. Mm. You, you've got to build credibility over time, and. One of the, the the hallmark features of great leaders is when they speak, people listen, and they've got respect um, and they've got credibility when they're when they're speaking. And so people lean into credible leaders, uh, but position might give you that opportunity, which is great. Uh, but ultimately, our goal should be how can I build credibility? Mm. So c- continuing on with the, the the theme of credibility, you you said you give people on page fifty one. So obvious obvious plug for the book there, listeners. <laughs> Uh, this five levels of leadership credibility uh, pyramid. Yep. Are you able to walk the leaders at a high level what, yeah. the, what the five levels are? Yeah, so I think we've touched just on, on one level. If you imagine the pyramid kind of working its way upwards, that base level um, is, is really around capability. It's that entry level to credibility. And it's really about, okay, maybe I've got a role or I have you know some skills that have enabled me to, to get the opportunity that's before me. And I often say to people, at that level, you need to invest in yourself and invest in getting better um, at what you do. So whatever it is you decide that this is how I want to be known or this is what I'd like the space I'd like to be in, you've actually got to do the work. Um, I, I got asked a lot quite recently around some of the the five hacks for public speaking. And everyone wants to know the shortcuts. And I often say there's actually no shortcuts to becoming great at this. It actually has to be something that you practice and invest in over time. So capability is that you might have an opportunity, but you've got to invest in getting in getting better yourself. So that is what I would say is the entry level to building credibility. The next level up, if you move up through the pyramid, is this idea of now of contribution, which is you might be really good at what you do, but have you actually invested um, that capability or that skill in other people. Um, and so I often say to leaders, you probably should be speaking at conferences. You should be speaking at town halls because it's an opportunity to share what you know. So I'd say the bottom level is, is all about investing in getting better. The second level is all about get better at investing. So you can be a really great tennis player in your backyard, but you've actually got to invest that and go and play at a competition to determine, hey, do I have something to add to the greater community of this space? Which kind of takes me to that next layer up, which is all around now, how do I build a community? So it's not just am I good at what I can at what I'm doing, or is is how can I help others get better at what I do? And you build this sense of community around um, investing in others. Um, so it's all about how can I get better at investing in others. And so we build a a, credi- a community around that that builds a reputation for how we'd like to be known. So you build community. And then I think the next layer up for that is really around consistency. And that's the long-term journey of credibility. It's we get better at investing in others. And so how do we keep making it an opportunity for uh, us to help others get better at what they do? And we do that over time. And I think that last layer then becomes credibility, which is really around that respect. You, you're respected because you've spent years of your life helping others get better at what they do. Yeah, okay. and I think you're right. It's very much doing that. Doing the work. It's doing the work. There's no shortcuts to credibility. Credibility can take a lifetime to build and a moment to ruin. And so it's worth investing into and taking the time. Yeah, it's interesting if you look at the, your point about the everyone wants the quick and easy way. Yeah. Uh, everyone that I think of that's successful in whatever realm of success you look at, whether sport, business, you know, Hollywood, whatever, yeah. very rarely is it, you know, the overnight or it's Never the overnight. It's always they're put in the work in some shape. Yeah, it's the over. Sometimes it can be the overnight recognition. Yeah. But the recognition is the result of a lifetime's work in the lead up to that. Mm. You look at anyone's successful journey, and it's filled with these ups and downs and successes Mm. and failures that led to that place. Yeah. So, I I'm not sure that a lot of leaders give a lot of thought to their reputation either within their own business or how they're seen as others? Why, why should people be thinking about their reputation? Yeah, if we talk about leading your narrative as the backstage of, um, of your leadership, then reputation is really the front stage piece of narrative. Narrative is kind of what we decide. Reputation is what others say about us. And I often say to the people that I work with that reputation speaks before you do. And the, where that came from is I was doing a Q&A once and someone asked me the question. They said, how do you build rapport quickly with an audience of people that have never heard you speak before and you're, you're fresh and you're, you're trying to just build that rapport really quickly. And I thought about it for a moment. There's lots of things you could do, but then I thought, actually it's, it's very, 
um, strange to think that a room full of strangers have never heard of us before they walk into the room because our world's so globally connected now mm. and people are always talking about us. They're searching for us. They're looking uh, us up online. So if we assume that nobody knows us or that they couldn't know about us within a few seconds, I think we're maybe fooling ourselves. And so I often say to people, it's really important to think about what reputation do I have and how is that helping me build and leverage my platform or how might it be hurting me without even knowing? Mm. And is that, is that linked to their value as a leader? Linked to their value as a leader? Yeah, their the reputation. Do they use their reputation to deliver and value? To give you an example, I was going to a conference one time. They were introducing a speaker and I'd never heard of the speaker before. And they were talking about to stand up on the stage and talk a lot about leadership and building healthy culture and we were in a group chat with a handful of friends and at the, at the same conference and my phone started buzzing in my pocket. And as they're introducing this person out to speak, I opened my phone. I looked at all these news articles that were getting posted in the group chat. And what I realized is there were news articles about um, workplace bullying and workplace harassment, all from a, a, about the person that was about to stand up and speak. And I realized in that moment, that person's reputation had spoken before that even opened their mouth. And I'm, I'm aware that the media has a one side to a story and there's much more, a much deeper uh, story to some of the initial uh, news articles that you read. But at that moment, somebody's reputation was about to undo everything that they were going to talk on. And so it's just being mindful uh, that as a leader, your reputation, everything that we're doing is saying something about who we are. And so it's being mindful of that. Yeah. So you asked readers of the book to consider about how they define their message. What what message are you, are you talking about there? That comes back to this idea of, are you just saying something for the sake of saying something? Or do you really have something valuable to say? Uh, do you have something that you can articulate and communicate in a way that people would walk away, grab hold of and remember? Or are you just trying to get as much content out in a short period of time as you can? So I often say to people, be really clear around what is it that I have to say or that I must say, or it's really easy to get caught up in all the things that we could say. So chapter seven was a big one. Yep. I thought that I'd imagine that a lot of people would be really interested in chapter seven. Uh, there's a lot of really cool presentation ideas. So I'm not going to go into all of those, but I'm going to pick on a few uh, points from, from chapter seven because I think it's uh, uh, important. So you talk about this idea with deliver, deliver with impact. Mm. How do we know as leaders that we are delivering with impact? Well, I think the goal of any public speaking opportunity whether it's a team meeting, whether it's a town hall or anything that sits in between those two, our main goal as a leader is not just to inform people. Really, we get information every day. Wherever we go, we're bombarded by information. We go outside, there's billboards. We go into our work and there's emails. There's, you know, forums, there's intranets. There's all this information. We have access to information. I think the goal of great leadership is to inspire change. And so if we're going to deliver a message with impact, the outcome of the goal should be is have we helped people change? Not have we just, have just, uh, we informed people's thinking? Have we transformed their thinking? Have we inspired and mobilized them towards taking some kind of action? And you introduced the, the readers to the flight path structure. <laughs> so at a very high level, because I don't take away all the secrets of the book, what, what, what's sort of the flight path structure? Yeah, I often think about uh, communication as taking people on a journey and it's taking people from where they are to ultimately at the end of it where do we need them to be you know when we talk about communication i talk about this incredible vehicle for change in that we can accomplish in a moment what might have taken weeks or months to accomplish trying to communicate individually. So we might have a hundred of our team in a room at the same time. There's this incredible opportunity to move them in the direction where we need them to go. It's quicker, it's easier, it's faster. But instead, if we don't do that well, we've got to spend all of our time going individually to people and trying to get them on board with where we're going. So I often use the metaphor of a flight path in that we get people on the plane, we get them in their um, seats buckled in, we take off, we take them on a journey, then we land and then we disembark them in another place and really that's the metaphor for i think taking people on a journey through their community through the way that we communicate so there's five principles that i want to explore from chapter seven mm. uh, which i think would really be worthwhile for the, the the readers to uh take on board and that is the first one is this idea of the principle of attention yeah so what's the principle of attention think about the principle of attention in terms of getting people on the plane Often as leaders, we've got 
somewhere we want to take people and we want some people to do something at the end of our, our presentation or the opportunity that we have to speak. And one of our biggest dilemmas is often we haven't considered our people on the plane before we take off. And so we walk into a room and our, our senses are bombarded. We've got phones buzzing in our pockets. We've got the temperature that's too hot or too cold. We've got people around us, got things in the back of our mind. We've got this fight for attention taking place. And one of the things I say to leaders, it's so important to make those first 30 seconds really intentional uh, to capture the attention of the people or the people that, or your audience to actually ensure, are they with me before we take off? Uh, are they on the same page? Are they listening? Do they do they care about what I'm talking about? And if we can do that, if we can get them on the plane, then we can actually move them in the direction where we need them to go. And principle number two, the principle of tension. Yeah. Healthy tension is a good thing. Tension in your neck, tension in your back, bad thing. Tension in a presentation, a really good thing. I mean, Hollywood thrives on this idea of tension, right? Yeah. This whole idea of tension and release. It's great music has this tension and this release. Great music has this build up and then it's the bass drop or it's the it's that kind of build up and everyone belts out at the top of their lungs. You're the voice trying to understand it, right? That's the <laughs> It's the tension and release moment. Yeah. And I think often we go into a presentation with this idea of here's the message or here's the idea and we give the release or we solve the problem, we answer the question, we relieve the tension and then we haven't considered, well, what was the question that we people would, would ask or what's the problem that people are facing? So we've got to actually create the tension before we resolve it. There's the old saying, you know, tell people what you're going to tell them, tell them and then tell them what you've told them, which I think is great. But it's kind of like going to a movie and going, show them the end of the movie, then take them on the journey, then show them the end of the movie again. Mm. And people, if you've seen the end of the movie, people hate spoilers. So there's something about if we create healthy tension, we don't just keep people, we get people's attention, we actually keep people's attention throughout the presentation. Okay. And the principle of perspective? Yeah, perspective is a big one. So if we talk about the the principle of, of tension is almost like the plane's taking off and there's that sense of excitement and anticipation of where we're going. I think about the, the principle of perspective as, as that flight and that journey. I often say, look out the left side of the plane, the right side of the plane. Perspective is all about how do we take something um, that maybe we're familiar with or a natural style of communication and communicate in a way that's relevant to everybody in the room. So for example, I'm a storyteller. I love telling stories. But not every room I go into, every not everyone loves hearing stories. Some people do, some people love it. So I've got to make sure that I don't just tell stories, but I also give people um, facts and information and data to support the stories that I tell. I can't just give a good case study um, and expect that everybody in the room is going to love that. So it's all about balancing. Okay, if I'm going to share some kind of key text, whether it's data, graph, information, case study, that I'm supporting it with some kind of um, personal story or metaphor, or, or I would describe it as some way of translating that in a way that makes sense for the people in the room okay and principle number four the principle of resolution yeah again it's moving from the, the place of tension to the place of resolution think about the plane coming into land Remember when i first started presenting one of my biggest challenges is that i would take off i would do the journey and then i would go i don't know how to land this plane one of my first presentations that i ever delivered was when i was in high school and it was supposed to be a four minute presentation and i got to the four minutes and thought i don't know how to land this plane around 17 minutes later circling the airport <laughs> the, the teacher walked from the back of the room put his hand on my shoulder and said i think that's enough now and one of the challenges is that we often don't know how to land this. And I would say that's why messaging is really important is we land on a really clear message that people can walk away and take away or we resolve that tension that we set up at the start. Okay. And then the final principle, which is this principle of action that you talk about. Yeah. Yeah, the principle of action is really all about if our goal is to create some kind of change for people, what can we do to give people something that they can walk away and do straight away? Usually at the end of a pre presentation, I, I encourage people to ask three questions. The first question is, what then? So what then? What, you've, you've given us all this information. You've shared this idea with us. Well, what then is the big idea you want me to walk away and remember? And I often look at it through the lens of if people walked out of the room and someone asked the question, what did they talk about? Could that person tell them the big idea of that presentation within 15 words or less. So what then is the big idea? The second question is, well, what if? What if everybody in the room took on board your idea and did it? and actually achieve what you wanted to, or what you'd set out to achieve. What would their world look like? What would our world look like? What would the business look like if people actually did that? It creates a sense of aspiration for the future. And the last question is, well, what now? 
I often describe people a little bit like water. We tend to follow the path of least resistance. Mm -hmm. And so if change is too complex or too difficult or it's too far away, then people walk away and they don't actually take any action. So I often say, what's the practical next step that a person could take having walked away from your presentation? Mm -hmm. You also talk about this idea of the four audience groups. Mm -hmm. And I thought this this was an interesting one because it will certainly help you shape the sort of style and message of your your presentation so what are the four audience groups yeah if you imagine almost a an outer circle a big circle uh, i would say there's a group of people who when it comes to your audience would be completely content unaware and what i mean by that is they they don't know anything about the content that you're about to deliver and if people have no idea or any frame of reference for the content you're about to deliver your, your frame of reference has to be wider. It has to be more open. You have to explain concepts. Um, so you might uh, have a very technical um, presentation that you need to deliver to a, a, a very average kind of person. They don't really know much about the content. So every time you use a word that's common to you, it, it's not common to everybody else. One example, I was working with an organization who, who who's in the movie business and they often use the word theatrical rather than the word movie. And when they use the word theatrical in-house, everybody understands that it means movies. Outside, everyone thinks Mm theatre. And so, again, the the content unaware, it has to be wider. So when you use the word theatrical, you need to give the definition. So you've got content unaware. Then you've got people who are content aware. So your circle of reference becomes smaller and more narrow. So you can use things that are more in-house. Then you've got from content aware, you've got content experienced. So people actually have a little bit of experience now with the content that you're delivering versus the very inner circle becomes more around your content experts. So the... The message or the the presentation that you would deliver to a content expert can be a lot more narrow than a content unaware person. So just being mindful of the audience that you're speaking to. Yeah. Yes, as you were speaking then, I, I was uh, thinking about um, the Master Chef finale, yep. which I watched with my my wife the other, the other day, and it was really interesting because in, what they had to do was um, you know, a final service for all their idols, all their you know the best chefs in Australia and all of that. And my wife and I were talking about the fact that how would it make you feel if, you know, in my line of work, if the only audience I was delivering to were my peers and the people that I respected most. And I imagine that if you're delivering to that inner circle, which is the content expert, I imagine it would change your overall feel towards the audience than if it was content unaware. Mm. Yeah, exactly. You you think about um, a small circle of content experts and you you might have words or, you know, some in-house jargon that you might use. Now, I'm not a big fan of jargon as it is, but when you're around your peers... Some of those those in-house terms can make everybody feel like they're included because everybody knows what you're talking about. But if you use in-house language when there's people in the room who are content unaware, it's actually very divisive and exclusive. Mm-hmm. So understanding who am I talking to, who's going to be in the room, and do they understand the concepts? And if they don't, I need to actually take that little bit of extra time to help bring them on the same page. Um, it's like when you when you're writing and you use uh, you know, use an acronym. The first time you use the um, acronym, you've got to explain explain what the acronym means and then from further on you can then use that acronym because people understand it same way if you're speaking and you use a technical term that people might understand take the extra few seconds to explain what it means so that when you use it later on people feel like they can connect with what you're saying i often get asked if uh, i get nervous with a new group do you ever get nervous when you every time training or presenting to a new group every time often the assumption of of a person who helps other leaders become more effective communicators is that you get judged to a really high standard and they assume that it become it comes naturally to you and it doesn't matter whether you've been presenting for a day or 10 years everybody to some extent has a reaction to having to put themselves out and be vulnerable in front of a group of people so if anyone ever feels that sense of immediate discomfort around that it's actually so normal yeah so you encourage the the readers to get better at thinking Mm -hmm. What are they thinking about? <laughs> <laughs> Often, uh, you know, there was a, a, a great LinkedIn post um, uh, from a friend of mine. Her name's Dr. Amy Silver. And she put a, a post on LinkedIn a couple of years ago. And she basically said, if you were to um, give five words of advice to somebody that's the best advice you've received, what would you say? And there were lots of pieces of advice on there. But one of them came up on, on, my, um, on my LinkedIn feed. And she basically said, get control over your thoughts. 
And for me, I wanted to just grab that and say, yeah, this is, if you can get this right, it's going to help in so many different ways. Often what's going on inside of our own head is either going to set us up for a huge success or a huge pitfall uh, because we tell ourselves these stories. We have these internal narratives taking place that are either going to propel us and help us do what we need to do, or they're going to trip us up and, and really kind of uh, undermine our own um, opportunities when we get them. Mm. One of the things I was interested in was, you know, how we can challenge dysfunctional thinking. And you referenced some cognitive behavior therapy, which is something I haven't explored ever in an <laughs> episode of this podcast. I'd like to do this as the very first micro introduction to it. Yeah. What are these three questions that uh, people should be asking themselves to challenge their thinking? Yeah. So my, my, I have a bit of an interesting background and in my undergraduate degree was in marketing and my postgraduate degree was in counseling. So I often <laughs> okay. find that a lot of the work I do sits at this intersection of people and business. And one of the things I think cognitive behavioral therapy is really helpful for is helping us to understand some of the internal conversations that we have with ourselves and how do we recognize some of those things. So I'd say Often when we find out we have to speak or we have to present, we go straight into that instinctive, I don't want to do this, I, I hate public speaking. And we start to tell ourselves, we have the, we develop this internal narrative. I think one of the first things we need to do is recognize that conversation, which is being able to ask ourselves, well, what am I telling myself about public speaking right now? And often some of the big things we say is, you know, public speaking is terrifying, I don't want to do that, what if I look like an idiot, uh, what if people, you know, think I'm no good. And we've got to be able to recognize those negative automatic thoughts when they come straight into our head. Because once we can recognize them, then the second thing we can do is start to reframe them. And you imagine you're about to walk on stage and you're sitting there and you're telling yourself, you cannot make a mistake. Do not stuff this up. People will think you're an idiot. If you sit there and you're repeating that conversation to yourself, how do you feel as a presenter? Well, you feel like, I don't want to stuff up. I can't make a mistake. I'm going to look like a fool. People are going to judge me harshly. What would it look like if rather than saying people, I can't make a mistake, people are going to judge me harshly. What if you realize that actually we're all humans and make mistakes and just because you make a couple of mistakes doesn't mean people are going to judge you harshly. It just means you're more human. What would be the difference between telling yourself one of those conversations versus the other conversation? One's going to make you feel restricted and you can't make a mistake. The other one's going to help you feel relaxed and more human. So being able to reframe that in a way that's more helpful would be the second thing. And the last piece is really around how can you refocus your energy rather than it being more on yourself. I often describe we go into a room with a selfie camera on, which is all about us. Yeah. We just look at ourselves. How do I look? How do I feel? How do I, you know, what would it look like if we flipped the camera and showed up in service to the people in the room and our energy was about and our attention was to the people that we're there to communicate with? I think that's a much better way to approach it. Okay. So we get towards the end of the book, you start introducing the, the readers to this idea that they need to get better at investing. So talk to me a little bit about that. Yeah, I would say everything gets better with time and investment. When it comes to public speaking, again, we talked about the idea of we want to find the hacks, we want to find the shortcuts. Uh, but just like learning to drive a car, learning to play an instrument, learning to dance or anything in between, if you invest in it, you can get better at it. Um, I often say that um, it takes a lot of effort to make something look effortless. And so everything that goes in behind the scenes, that time of investment, that time of practice, and that time of preparation is all setting you up to have a better experience when you do take it public. You also ask people to get better at asking. Mm. What are they asking? Asking for feedback, seeking out feedback. I would say there's two really important things. One is to, to um, proactively seek out feedback and and to find feedback from trusted sources. And then the second thing is to actually embrace feedback as part of your development and opportunity to grow. One of the good questions that I often encourage people to ask, one of the first questions they ask when they walk off stage uh, is always around, well, how did I do? And they always want to know, give me some feedback on how did I do? And really it's, it's asking for feedback on a performance. And so I often ask people to reframe that question. Rather than asking how did I do, consider asking people how did I help? And, and, and seek out feedback in the sense that what changed for you? What was different? What stood out to you? Because if people can't tell you how you've helped, then there's a much deeper problem than how you've delivered it. And it really comes back to more around what was my message? What did I want people to change? What did I want people to think or know or do? And so I would say we need to seek out feedback and then openly embrace that feedback. And really that comes down to our humility, our ability to take on feedback and change and have a growth mindset. Yeah. So you, your point just then about taking on feedback... How do we encourage leaders not to have that sense of resistance mm -hmm. when they hear the feedback, which may be expected, maybe not, but it's certainly not 
endorsing whatever path they're going in it and we're encouraging them to look at themselves. How do we encourage people not to have that resistance? Oh. It's, it's really difficult when someone puts up a mirror mm. to take a look at what's going on. And it can be it can be challenging to receive feedback. I would say two things. One, make sure the person that giving that's giving the feedback is a trusted source for feedback. You could take on feedback from everybody and you could become a different person every single day. So make sure that the person that you take the feedback from is a trusted source for that feedback. And the second thing is really going to come down to a sense of humility. I think the, the, the best opportunity for growth that we have is at this intersection of, of vulnerability, um, which is really being open and to receiving that feedback and teachability, which is that sense of how can we remain teachable. And it doesn't matter how long you've been speaking for. It doesn't matter, it doesn't matter how long you've been leading for. If we can stay teachable, we'll continue to grow and develop. The moment we close off that teachable nature, we stop growing and we stop developing. The moment we stop being vulnerable, is the moment we actually close ourselves off to the ability to, to grow and develop. So stay teachable and stay vulnerable. Okay. Are there any books or leaders or people that inspire you? I often get asked this question. The, the, the two questions are either who are the leaders that inspire you or who are some really great communicators that you've seen or speakers that you've seen. And often the people that come to my mind straight away are not the people that are the most well-known people. And so I think for me, I've always looked at this question through the lens of, okay, what is it about these people that have inspired me? Or what is it about these people that, that I admire? So I look at somebody like Brene Brown, who is just taking over the world in terms of what she's done in the space of vulnerability and shame research. And really what she's done has, has built a lifetime of commitment to an idea that's now just starting to get recognition. So the thing I love and I'm so inspired about her is that she's made this decision long before she ever got a, a public profile or a public platform. And so it comes back to that idea of deciding who do you want to be and how do you want to be known? She inspires me. Um, I've got a good friend. Her name's Lisa O'Neill. She's a, a speaker from um, New Zealand. And one of the things I love about her is when she shows up to her room, she is her most authentic, genuine self, and she is unapologetically herself. And one of the biggest challenges when we look at people who inspire us, we go, how can I do more of what they do rather than understanding why do they do what they do? Mm. And I think sitting behind those two people are a lifetime of commitment to, and dedication to their craft and also a commitment to just being authentic and who they really are. Mm. It's, I, think, I think it's an interesting perspective rather than, you know, how can I do more of that, but what's it taken? Yeah, what is, what is it? We often want to know the outcome yeah. and we don't want to know the process. So what would it look like to understand the process? If we understood their process, we would know why they are the way they are. So rather than trying to replicate outcome, try to understand process and figure out how does that apply and what can I learn from the process of that? Mm -hmm. If people want to find out more about you and all of the work that you do, where should they go? You can Google Shane Michael Hatton and yep. it'll come up anywhere in there or you can visit shanemhatton.com. Okay. And any last words on leadership? I love what you're doing in this podcast. One of the things that you say is you're raising the standard of leadership. Thank you. Our world needs great leaders. And so the fact that people would take time to listen to this, that you would take time to invest in leaders, our world needs more great leaders. So keep committing to helping great leaders, to telling the stories of great leaders because we need them. Well, on that note, <laughs> thanks so much, Shane, for being part of the Synergy and Leadership Podcast. Thank you. Well, that wraps up episode 88 of the Synergy and Leadership Podcast, another great author interview episode for you. I'd like to encourage you to head on over to the Synergy and Group website and engage in the conversation with us. Tell us what you liked about the episode, tell us who you'd like us to interview, or tell us what sort of content you'd like us to deliver to. And if you are an iPhone user, please feel free, head on over to the Apple site and leave us a review really does help us build awareness of the podcast and share all these great messages around leadership and management. Next week's episode, we have another great author interview episode for you, where I speak with Julia Steele, who is the author of Buy-In, How to Lead Change, Build Commitment, and Inspire People. It's another great interview. Till then, love to hear what you think. Happy listening.